I'm just saying the battery because yeah, I, I gotcha. managed to forget my cord. I gotcha. What you're saying is I'm on the hook whether anybody watches or not, right? <laughs> oh, we got one person. I already started it, so yeah, we got one person watching. Hello. Got two. Is the is the TV on? Oh yeah, no worries. I mean, you have an audience on here, so yeah. You, we had three, and then I think they left. I don't know who's back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I started it five minutes before, so that way people could start getting on and they wouldn't miss your intro. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to record you on here because this is like, it's too wide shot. So, just on here. And when it doesn't save, then it doesn't save. <laughs> I think I have a similar talk on, on YouTube already, so. Okay, so we can link, we can link that up. Don't tell your audience that they can just leave. I know. Both of them. <laughs> you want me to announce that uh, yes, yes. Bennett Bell talk is Yes, if you wouldn't shot. mind doing that first. The person who is uh, watching online, could you please comment and let me know if you can hear? Can you comment, I guess? I can kind of see that the mic is moving. Made a pipe, you oh. can proceed, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the weather's going to keep your crowd down. That's right. <laughs> oh, there. Right. Uh, so, Bennett, 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 Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm managing the, the live stream.
Welcome, guys. My name is Derek Brown. I'm the operations manager at Bentonville Battlefield, and I, I am here to talk about Bentonville. Uh, the title of my presentation is the Western Theater Shiz East, the Battle of Bentonville. Um, yeah, so, all right, Bentonville's last major battle of the Western Theater, uh, but it was fought fewer than 100 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. This shows how poorly, poorly the war was going for the Confederacy as we moved into the spring of 1865, which we all now know was the culmination of the war. Like so many other battlefields during the Civil War, there's nothing particularly worth fighting for in Bentonville itself. That's one of the most common points made, when we, especially when we have military staff rights. They're like, what? What in the world is worth fighting for here? Uh, Bentonville just happened to be where two roads intersected. Um, and by the third day, though, of the Battle of Bentonville, there will be 80,000 soldiers in Bentonville. Uh, just happens to be that 60,000 of them were on the Union side, and there were 20,000 Confederates. Uh, 4,200 casualties, 4,133 to be exact. I know that number, and I will forever know that number because we lit a luminary candle for every casualty of the battle last March for our 157th anniversary. And I, I think I have the image of that later in, in my slide. And I still have the indentation on my thumb from all those uh, clicker, clicker <laughs> candles. So, yeah. At least they weren't real candles. All right, so. Since I only have you guys for four or five hours, <laughs> I'm going to take it easy on everyone and only rewind a year uh, to the um, spring of 1864. Uh, to understand the battle of Bentonville, you really have to start with the Atlanta campaign. And you can see Sherman's armies on the map there uh, moving south from uh, essentially uh, North Georgia to towards Atlanta. And when I say Sherman's armies, you can see on the map you technically three armies there, uh, totaling almost 100,000 men. Uh, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston commanding roughly 70,000 men, constantly retreating ahead of Sherman, trying to find a place to ambush him, set up traps and things like that. Um, but the problem is that Johnston was giving ground as he was doing this. And Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Johnston were not exactly sending each other Christmas cards already by this point. They were not a great, they did not have a great relationship. Johnson's not very communicative with, to Davis with his plans. Davis is worried that Johnson's going to eventually give up Atlanta without a fight. Um, he kind of saw this a little bit as Johnson retreated on the Virginia Peninsula when Johnson was in command of the main Confederate army outside of Richmond way back in the spring of, eight, of 1862. Um, Johnson retreated all the way to the gates of Richmond before finally launching an assault. That assault Although it slowed the Union Army down, um, it didn't do really well for General Johnson, who was seriously wounded in that, that assault, a, fray, uh, a stray artillery fragment, wounded Johnson in the hip. Um, and um, of course, um, Johnson has to go home to recuperate, and his army is given Robert E. Lee, and that army, of course, becomes famous as Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, Johnson's on the shelf for months, almost a year, and eventually, of course, when he comes back, they're not taking the army away from Lee, so Johnston gets sent out west. Um, Johnston did not attack um, the Union army from behind at Vicksburg, and Davis is, is worried that Johnston's timidity is going to make him, is going to have him give up Atlanta. Um, so Davis, of course, is going to fire him at the gates of Atlanta. John Bell Hood is given command of the army, which he, and you don't really have to remember that name as much, but, but Hood is going to proceed to partially wrecked the army and Atlanta's going to fall anyways. So now that Johnson's retired, Johnson's fired, he's going to call it retired, he's got nothing else to do, so he spends a lot, a lot of time at home in Columbia initially, and then, then eventually once Columbia's threatened, Lincoln in North Carolina is where he's going to retire to. He's going to spend his free time writing hate mail to his, mothers, to his buddies in Congress about Davis. Uh, so, um, so Atlanta's going to eventually fall anyways. And after Atlanta, Sherman's going to march, going to do his famous march to the sea. Um, the Confederate forces, the Army of Tennessee that had been defending Atlanta, pulls back. In fact, pulls into Alabama initially, then moves into Tennessee with the hope that Sherman's going to follow them. Sherman realizes that's what Hood wants him to do, so he's going to do the opposite. He's going to he's going to take um, um, his force down to Savannah. Uh, very little opposition, Confederate militia, Confederate cavalry, 
and he's going to capture Savannah uh, and eventually from Savannah he's going to in February of 1865 uh, he's going to cross the Savannah River and start moving into South Carolina um, bullseye into the heart of, heart of the Confederacy now meanwhile things are going going great for the Confederates in Virginia as well. Um, Robert E. Lee fights a series of tactically successful battles against um, the armies of, of uh, General Grant, um, um, but these battles um, do not really lead to any type of strategic Confederate victory. Um, the Confederates of uh, the Union Army is actually just able to go around at, uh, Lee's army and starts threatening Richmond and uh, from the north um, Lee is going to be able to keep them out of Richmond, but they're just going to cross the river and move into Petersburg from the south. And it's going to start a siege uh, in the late spring of, uh, or early summer of 1864. Uh, that siege is going to last almost to the end of the war. Uh, Lee is able to use his force that varied in num numbers from 60 to 70,000 men um, uh, at various points. He's going to be able to use his force to keep Grant out of Richmond. But Sherman, who's down in South Carolina now, has a bead on Lee's army. And Sherman can come up and join with Grant. They're going to be able to overwhelm Lee at Richmond. And Lee, it's very important to remember what kind of figure head Lee is by 1860, late 1864, early 1865. Now, this is very important to keep in mind, too. Um, despite everything we think about Robert E. Lee as the Confederate, as the principal Confederate general in the war, remember he's not made Confederate general in chief until February of 1865. And I always like to say that's the perfect example of shutting the barn door after the cows got away, right? Um, but um, Lee is such an important figure in the South that if Lee is forced to capitulate, the war is going to be over, if not officially, um, um, unofficially. Um, so um, Lee, Lee's army has to be able to survive. And if, once again, if Sherman comes up and joins with Grant, Lee's going to be overwhelmed. Abraham Lincoln in the North, probably, especially after his re-election in 1864, is probably the one person in the North who could single-handedly maybe end the war. Um, Lee, I really believe that he's that person in the South by 1864. It is not President Davis. And of course, once again, made commanding general in February of 1865. So finally, he at least has titular authority to be able to cooperate with other theaters, to be able to order other Confederate generals and other theaters to cooperate with his plans. He technically did not have that until 1865. So what is Lee going to do about Sherman? Um, Lee can think of only one person who has the, the confidence of the people, confidence of the armies, who's not doing it, doesn't have another important job to do right now. Well, he can only think of one person, and of course, that's Joe Johnston. And President Davis is more or less a body. That's, now, that's never going to happen. Uh, but Lee insists. Remember, once again, how important is Lee by 1865? I would definitely argue, um, at least in people's minds, he's much more important than the president. So once Lee insists on it, there's really nothing Davis can do about it. Um, so Johnson's going to be called back, much to Johnson's objections, at least at first. Johnson's like, oh, wait a minute. Now, this is just Davis is doing this to pull me back to be the scapegoat. I will be the one to have to surrender to Sherman. No, 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 no. But once Johnson finds out that it's Lee's confidence in him, he agrees to take the job. That relationship between Lee and Johnston, which had been extremely tight during the Mexican War, had been extremely tight at West Point, at West Point classmates, had been extremely tight before the war, had really frayed because Johnston's, I hate to say it, but Johnston's ego bristled at what Lee was able to do with the army Johnston had commanded. I think ego might be too strong a word. Uh, Johnston, Johnston definitely. Um, um, yeah, Johnson's, uh, Johnson's ego was strong. And so with Lee taking over that army and Johnson kind of being sidelined, sent out west, which in everybody's mind, even except for modern historians, really was a demotion. Um, um, so that bristled. But, but once 
Josh will learn it at least confidence in him. And he learns this through a mutual friend, Senator Louis Wigfall from Texas, who tells Josh, no, 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 it's Lee's confidence in you. And Wigfall and Davis were not allies whatsoever. So that's how he, that's, that's how, that's why Josh is going to agree to accept the job. Um, and so he's back on the scene here. All right. But Justin probably immediately wishes he hadn't when he starts getting these word, these orders from Lee. All right, soon command, sign everybody, almost everybody outside of my department under your command and form an army to drive back Sherman. And Johnson quickly says, no, 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 no it's too late for all that. Um, um, why don't I just get whatever forces I can and come up here and help, help you out? Why don't I just go up to Richmond, Petersburg, help you out? And Lee's going to respond that, um, that if you do that, to sum up that lot of writing, if you do that, you're going to abandon my food supplies in eastern North Carolina. And when I say my food supplies, my food supplies for my army, not for your army. Your army's got to live off the land. That food stuff is important for my army. And if you do that, you're going to abandon that. We're both going to starve. So you've got to stay down there and at least keep a force um, somewhere in eastern North Carolina. Strike Sherman a blow. Uh, a bold and unexpected attack might, might really drive them back. But oh, by the way, don't get your army destroyed because that's not doing me any favors either. So it's a pretty tough task. Yeah. Um, as Lee says, if the road to Raleigh is interrupted, I'm going to have to evacuate. So, what kind of forces, what kind of hand has Johnston been dealt? Well, first off, he's more or less taken over for Beauregard. And Beauregard's going to be retained as Johnston's number two. Beauregard was given command of the remnants of the Army of Tennessee and the Department of the South um, after, after Hood's physical and mental breakdown after, after Franklin and Nashville. And we'll talk briefly about Franklin and Nashville in just a second. Um, so Beauregard's going to be there. Uh, Beauregard's willing to cooperate with Johnson, no problem. I think, I think there's an idea that Beauregard, I think a Beauregard mind is going to be great somebody else to step in and take this weight off his shoulders. Um, although Beauregard always has these great ideas about forming these armies and marching on the Ohio River and all this stuff, and all that stuff's very imaginative. The next portion is Wade Hampton, uh, General Wade Hampton's cavalry command. Wade Hampton had taken over for Jeb Stewart and Lee's army after Stewart was killed at Yellow Tavern. Uh, but then Hampton gets permission because Sherman is approaching Columbia. Spoiler alert, we'll cover that in a minute. Um, um, as Sherman's approaching Columbia, um, Hampton gets permission to go down to South Carolina to ostensibly to remount his troopers because Confederate cavalry was responsible for their own mounts. Um, but, but actually, is going to go down and see what he can do about defending Columbia, where his home was. Um, he, he's, he's allowed to take Butler's cavalry division from Lee's army with him. Um, so William J. Hardy is the next part. Hardy commands a lot of, more or less, a handful of veterans, but more or less a lot of garrison troops from Savannah and Charleston. Um, um, some of those guys are militia. They're not technically allowed to leave their home state unless some rules are bent or, or changed. Um, so um, Hampton has about 6,000 6, cavalry, Hardy um, somewhere around 11,000 um, heavy artillerists um, and some veteran infantry. So whilst he uh, heavy artillerists, you command a big, you're, you, you're the garrison of Fort Sumter, for instance, uh, Alfred Retz Brigade, for instance. You're the garrison of Fort Sumter. We have to evacuate Fort Sumter. We're not taking these big Howard, these big Seacoast guns with us. Um, so these, uh, you know, so guess what? You're in the infantry now, and they they tend to call those guys red infantry because red is the artillery color, and they often have that on their uniform. So let's just say they not been these guys have not been in a stand up fight other than behind fort walls um, throughout most of the war. So that next contingent, this um, these important guys, um, that's the that's that's um. Uh, Probably a lesser known Confederate um, general, AP, but not AP Hill, AP Stewart. Um, AP Stewart, um, Lieutenant General 
has been given command of what's left of the actual Army of Tennessee. Um, and when I do say what's left, it is a meager force, comparatively speaking. Remember, I said it's, only, it's approaching 70,000 men in May of 64. 4,500 of them will make it to North Carolina by March 19th to fight at Bentonville. 4,500. 6,500 by the time the battle's over. So that's fewer than 10% 10, 10 of that army. Uh, some more are going to trickle in after that, though. Um, so we'll say 10 to 15, we'll say maybe 15% to be generous um, of the army that have been at Franklin and Nashville. Um, the Confederates fight the Battle of Franklin and Nashville. And December, remember December 64, um, Hood technically, I guess by Civil War terms, you can, someone could argue that he won Franklin despite getting his army partially destroyed. He continues on though, follows the Union Army to Nashville where he finishes getting the army destroyed. And it is really destroyed as in, um, <coughs> let me erase General Stewart. Um, <laughs> the army um, is so badly mangled that as it's retreating down to Tupelo, Mississippi, um, uh, there, there's no supplies, the, wagons, the wagon train's gone. Um, um, once they kind of try, once Hood tries to regroup them, he's forced to furlough much of the army because he just has no supplies for them. They're told to go home and come back in a month. There are a lot of those Tennessee guys and Mississippi guys. Now, I'm like, yeah, right. I mean, the war's almost over. You've been in the army struggling. You go home and you see how badly your family's struggling, for one. And you say, I can be much more help here. Or, on the other hand, say your family somehow misses out on a lot of these hardships. You go home and start eating mama's cooking again. Um, coming back um, is, is going to be a tough sell. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of those guys need to say do not. Um, and then, of course, the next contingent is a late addition to Johnson's force. That guy, um, notorious in North Carolina circles, is General Braxton Bragg. Uh, Bragg had been put in command of the Wilmington defenses, uh, the Department of North Carolina, in the fall of 64. Uh, once Confederate, Confederate intelligence figures, uh, finds out that the Union Army and Navy are going to eventually move on Fort Fisher, um, Lee, um, excuse me, um, well, Lee is going to dispatch a portion of his army, Robert F. Hope's North Carolina Division, some of Lee's veterans. Um, but at the last minute, President Davis says, okay, well, we need somebody, we need an important guy down there to take command of all this stuff. Uh, I guess Major General Robert F. Hope wasn't good enough, so um, he's going to assign General Braxton Bragg. Uh, the Richmond Examiner says Bragg goes to Wilmington, goodbye Wilmington. And that's actually what's going to happen. Um, Bragg goes down there and refuses to allow Hope to attack the Union uh, invasion fleet, uh, the invasion, invading force during the Second Battle of Fort Fisher on uh, January 15th of 65. Um, and so what's going to eventually happen is, um, is they're going to capture the fort, and once Fort Fisher is captured, Wilmington really ceases to really exist as a blockade running forward. Um, that's really crippling for Lee's army. Lee, Lee, as badly as Lee was outnumbered, he was willing to sacrifice Hope's 5,000 men to come down to North Carolina because he knew how important Wilmington was. And he, Lee sent a letter to Davis that says, Save Richmond. <laughs> Wilmington is the most important place. If Lee, did, if Lee wasn't writing that to Davis, or if Lee was not a Virginian, Lee would have honestly said Wilmington was the most important uh, city in the South. Not <coughs> but anyways. So, Bragg, remember Bragg and Davis, by this point, the war are friends. Um, Bragg, no one liked Bragg except for one, and that's Davis. Davis sustained Bragg. In fact, Bragg had been the one who advised Davis to fire Johnson in Atlanta. Now Bragg's been put under Johnson's command here. Both four stars um, in Bentonville, um, you know, a perfect example of too many chiefs and not enough Indians on the Confederate side for sure. Um, so you got these four stars. Um, Johnson is going to try to forget about all that for the present emergency. Set, up, set a positive example for his men. So all these guys together, um, somewhere around 18 to 18 to 19,000, 18,000 ish infantry, and about six 6,000 cavalry um, is what um, Johnson is able to kind of gather as a force eventually. 
Um, how is that going to contend with Sherman's armies? Um, 60,000 men. Sherman called now when he left Savannah um, because he, can't, he doesn't want to take as many wagons. He wants to take a few wagons as he has to. He also only wants the really healthy men, the ones who are in the best physical shape, the best soldiers. Um, so he's going to call down to about 60,000. He's going to have them divided into two armies. You can see those two lines there on the map. Uh, General Howard's army, the army of the Tennessee, not to be confused with the army of Tennessee, the Tennessee's name for the river, of Tennessee's name for the state. I think they, they conspired to make that the most confusing thing in the world for us, mm -hmm. um, look, looking back on it. Um, and then the army of Georgia under Henry Warner Slocum, the left wing, the right wing is Howard's wing. Um, Thing is, if you've got 60,000 men in enemy territory living off the land, you can't keep them all together because you're not going to find food for 60,000 men. So you fan them out, spread them out, try to keep them in supporting distance since you are technically in enemy territory. Um, Sherman, typically Sherman would, would try to keep his armies um, less than 20 miles apart. Um, but um, that's the thing. 20,000 Confederates cannot realistically expect to defeat 60,000. But they might stand a chance against 30,000. If you have these armies separated, um, you can you can possibly do that. So Henry Slocum, as I mentioned, O. o. Howard here. Um, <laughs> coincidentally, um, both army of the Potomac veterans who had also been sent to the minor leagues um, in 1863 um, uh, for not doing well at Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, for instance, 11th and 12th Corps, um, eventually um, being merged form the 20th Corps, which, which comprises half of the left wing under Slocum. And they're going to, of course, eventually fight at Bentonville, which uh, maybe is not quite to scale, although it was a large battle in North Carolina there. <laughs> so here's the plan. General Hampton, that able cavalry commander under Johnston, is doing his job. He is over at the Battle of Abesboro, Abesboro uh, March 15th and 16th. Uh, uh, with Hardy, who finds out from, they capture enough Union prisoners to figure out that the Union Army, when it moves into North Carolina, is moving to Goldsboro, of all places. And I know that might seem a little bit strange to our modern minds. I work, you know, 20 miles from home, Goldsboro, and people are always like, what, what in the world, why does Sherman want to go to Goldsboro, of all places? Um, not to pick on Goldsboro too much, but um, there was no air Air Force Base there, then, for instance, so why is Goldsboro important? It did happen to be where two railroads intersected from the coast. If you go back to that previous map I should have showed you, let's take that big bit and go off of it. Um, you can see the railroad coming out of Wilmington there where it says Brad and Terry, uh, the railroad coming out, out of Wilmington. Okay, well, what's that port of Wilmington is going to fall in, in late February? Their union, if the Union Army can repair that railroad up to Goldsboro, Sherman can get to Goldsboro and they can get supplies. And that's <laughs> secondary. Um, primary is a Union Army had landed way up over here in Newburn in February of 1862. Um, excuse me, March of 1862. They landed on Roanoke Island in February of 1862. There had been a Union Army stationed in eastern North Carolina the entire war. That just really hadn't done much. Um, I actually wrote my master's thesis about that, that in graduate school. That is just like, they, they just kind of sit there. And so it's, it's kind of baffling. But they can move up and join Sherman. Also, the Union Navy can resupply them there in Newburgh, bring re reinforcements. Sherman, if he can get, get to Goldsboro, is getting approximately, basically a third army. If he can get to Goldsboro, a 30,000 more men. So Goldsboro is extremely important. Uh, the Confederates had need to find a way. Um, it was possible Sherman was instead heading to Raleigh. Raleigh's the obvious place, right, as the capital, as the state, state capital. But at Abersboro, they're going to figure out on March 16th from prisoners that they're actually heading to Goldsboro. And these Union soldiers are super excited because they've been told they're getting paid when they get there, they're getting mail, they're getting all sorts of new uniforms, food that they didn't have to um, scavenge, things like that. Um, so that's where they really want to get to. Um, so Wade Hampton, when the Union Army turns towards on the Goals, on the Aversboro Goldsboro Road, Hampton's going to be riding out in front of him, and um, and he's going to be looking for a place for Johnson to get his forces together and ambush. Now Johnson's headquarters was in Smithfield. I rewind back to that map to show you Smithfield, but Smithfield was such an important place that it wasn't even on that map. 
uh, that up. So actually, um, spin fields equal distance between Goldsboro and Raleigh, roughly. So the goal would be, um, with Justin there, um, where can Justin get his army down? Um, and this road right here, where you see the red coming out, that road's going to eventually lead up, lead up to Smithfield, and that's going to lead to the Wills Coal Plantation, where that intersection is right there, above those arrows. And if, um, uh, if Hampton can buy enough time to slow the left wing down, Johnson will be able to get his army out in front of the left wing. Um, and one thing's going to come into the Confederates' favor uh, is because this guy, William um, Passmore Carlin, or the commander of the 1st Division, he's very headstrong, West Point trained, puts on his finest uniform on the morning of March 19th. Nimlar says he knows there's going to be a, be a battle. Most likely he thought he's going to be the first general in the Goldsboro. And so he's not really paying attention to warning signs. He's also heard Sherman say, he heard Sherman say to his commanders that there's nothing but dismounted Confederate cavalry and militia that the Confederate army has fallen back from Raleigh. And why does, he, why does Sherman think that? Because Sherman's cavalry commander is the anti-Hampton. Justin Kilpatrick is not doing his job. Uh, Kilpatrick is not getting good in, information um, to um, Sherman. Kilpatrick's kind of bristling. He got surprised at the Battle of Monroe's Crossroads on, um, uh, which is now on Fort Bragg's um, post now. Um, Kilpatrick was almost captured, quite literally has run off in his pajamas. Um, so he had a rather rough day. Um, and um, um, so he wants to do stuff to kind of regain his name. Screening and scouting are not those things. Let's do something. Let's, let's, let's pillage a little bit. Let's, let's joy ride. And so he's not screaming like he should. So that kind of falls to the foragers. And the foragers were out ahead of the army finding that food. So they're the ones reporting back to Carlin and to his commander, 14th Corps commander, with the unfortunate name Jefferson Davis. No relation to Confederate president. He probably would have shot you if you had said so. And I'm not exaggerating uh, because he did shoot and kill his commanding officer early in the war. Here's a newspaper account of it. Uh, General William Nelson, William Bull Nelson, in Louisville, Kentucky, in the Gaunt House Hotel. Uh, they got an argument. They'd been feuding for a couple of days. Nelson reached out to show orders to Davis. Davis says he thought Nelson was grabbing a pistol. He grabs his first and shoots Nelson down, kills him. Um, Davis is arrested, as you might expect he would be, um, but he's never prosecuted. Sherman says he likes fighting generals. And that sounds like a fighting general. There never has been one. Um, so, um, Carlin and Davis also have been, been feuding for two years. They've been feuding since, or a year and a half anyway, they've been feuding since the Battle of, um, uh, well, really two years. They've been feuding since the Battle of Stones River, Murfreesboro, um, which was fought on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, 62-63. Um, um, they've been feuding, and who got credit for that? And when, Carl, when Davis was made Carlin's commander, David, Carlin tried to resign, and Lincoln wouldn't accept Carlin's resignation. So they don't talk very much. Carlin, that passive-aggressive thing, he's going to get his men up early, put on that fine uniform, and be the first one in Goldsboro, beating his corps commander or any other Union division there at Goldsboro. So that's going to really play to the Confederates' trap. Hampton rides out in front, uh, takes uh, Dibral, which is the Army of Tennessee Cavalry Brigade, out in front. So this is Joe Wheeler's guy so from the Army of Tennessee. Um, and they set up these bar this barricade right there. So what's his light rail works? Um, I had to explain to someone that did not mean a railroad. Um, rail is in fence rails, um, barricading the road. And the fence rail thing is always humorous to me because farmers complain to Governor Vance that the Confederate Army kept taking all their fence rails. And Vance issued an order that you can only take, that these soldiers, well, since it is an emergency, soldiers need fence rails to build defenses for firewood in an expedient situation. They can only have the rail on top. They only have the top rail. <laughs> All right, that army leaves. So you had a four rail fence. That army leaves. Now you have a three rail fence. Well, once again, that top rail is, is in trouble when that ne next army shows up. So it's always funny, the top rail up. Lot was, was considered the top rail, but anyways, um, uh, Hampton's going to buy time, and Johnson's going to slide his army to 17 miles south 
overnight from Smithville to Bentonville to the coal plantation. Um, and um, um, Mr. Hampton, once again, screaming, doing a good job, makes the Federals deploy, buying time. In fact, so much so that Carlin gets aggravated with the foragers. He tells them, in not very nice terms, um, get yourself out of the way, and I'll drive them out with a skirmish line. Needless to say, that doesn't happen either, but Carlin is going to be able to launch that huge flank assault over there, send, sending those six blue regiments over there by themselves way to the left off the road against a Confederate army that they have no idea is there. Because the whole Confederate plan is, and of course, if we were at Bentonville, I'd be showing you that foliage right now, but that army is hiding, hiding in those woods. Whereas Bragg's job, so that's the army of Ten Tennessee up there, and it's supposed to be Hardy's Corps. So roughly 10,000 men is what it's supposed to be, 10 to 11,000 men. Um, Bragg, with another 8,000 or so, is supposed to be blocking the road. So as the Union Army eventually, as Sherman, as, as Hampton pulls out, Union, Union Army is going to butt heads with Bragg's command. They're going to deploy, not knowing those Confederates are hiding in those woods above them. They're going to strike. It's gonna, going to be like a hammer and an anvil. And they're maybe knock out maybe the entire 14th Corps, and then things start looking better. Um, by nu numerically speaking. So if you take out these divisions as they arrive on the field, the Confederates all, all of a sudden aren't really outnumbered, are they? But of course, such battle plans are always great to a first contact with the enemy, right? And so, um, as you see Hampton riding away there, back to the coal plantation, uh, um, So Carlin is going to deploy those six regiments up there to the north, like I said, to flank out Hampton or flank out whatever Confederates are in front of them. And then, though, the problem is um, those three blue and those three white right there next to them, just south of, of the road. I wish I had my pointer here. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, there you go. So these three regiments here, these guys aren't here yet. Um, so these, these six regiments right here and these six regiments here, they're all Carlin's. Carlin's division gets split in half. Now, how does that happen? Well, they're taking artillery fire from right. I get this right here. They're taking artillery fire from here and from up here. And these guys run into the safety of this ravine. The other guys move south of the road. There's a big gap in the Union lines. These guys are kind of holding the road. Carlin, remember, wants to be that first into Goldsboro, and he's not convinced that there's really going to be a major fight here. So if he can still hold on to the road with one of his regiments or, 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 or one of his brigades, he's still, he's still going to be able to not be leapfrogged by the next Union division behind him. And so he's still going to be first in. Um, so they lose sight of each other. Um, 33rd Ohio, these guys over here on the right, when they start taking artillery fire, they run in Willis Cole's house, three-story plantation home, one of the only true stereotypical classical, classical southern plantations in Bentonville. Uh, most of the other folks were upper middle class farmers. Um, they run into Cole's house and they start taking artillery fire. Um, and a, a Confederate junior reservist says that the Yankees came running out of that house, house like rats off a sinking ship. They take refuge in this ravine down here, but Carlin gets them rallied and pushes them across that open field right here to go around the Confederate line, not knowing these guys are all up here. And when they get 40 paces from the Confederate line, which is hidden in foliage, the Confederates are going to rise up and make matters simple shoot them in the face. They're going to retreat back to the, that ravine, but instead of Carlin pulling them to safety over here, which he probably should have. Um, he's going to dig them in on the Confederate side. And by this point, it's about 1 o'clock on March 19th. Um, they have a, over, over an hour to dig. Johnson's waiting for his entire army to get here before he launches his major assault. Um, 
And part of that army getting here is Colifer, Colifer's division, excuse me, that's Major Will Eaton, who was killed in Carlin's probing assault, 13th Michigan, has his grave marker, um, which is owned by the 13th Michigan Association. We have a copy of it at Bentonville. Um, they buried him with an ammunition chest at his grave marker, and then a year later, veterans came down from Michigan and got Eaton's body. He was commander of 13th Michigan, Major Eaton. He had been promoted to colonel, but the word did not get to Savannah in time for those guys to leave. So he's still acting as a major, not knowing he's been promoted to colonel. So Carl says, he's confident in my ability to hold my position until troops from the rear should come up. I decided not to fall back. And he digs in in that. And that's just about probably how it looked then. Um, and they're on the Confederate side. Um, they're in a bad spot. When that Confederate assault is finally made, uh, it's going to get really bad. All right, this guy, and you can tell that's not a Civil War uniform he's wearing, uh, because at Bentonville, he's a 20-year-old captain. Uh, major, he's going to be uh, become um, a major general during the Spanish-American War, uh, William Ludlow. Now, why do I have Anthony Hopkins' picture up there on here? Legends of the Fall. Anybody seen Legends of the Fall? Thank you. Thank, thank you. I was saying that to a military staff right the other day, and they were like, how old do you think we are? Um, but uh, uh, Legends of, of the Fall, Anthony Hopkins' character is William Ludlow. Uh, a fictionalized version, of course. Um, Ludlow's, Sherman's, um, excuse me, is, is Slocum, the left wing commander's chief. In here, he tells Carlin to pull back to the opposite side. Carlin doesn't do so. He says, you're just a 20-year-old captain. There's no telling what words he used. Go back to headquarters, and he stays on the wrong side of that ravine. Um, so the main Confederate assault is going to happen when Hardy gets in position. So Army of Tennessee here, Tolliver's division from Hardy's Corps here, and then it's going to be McClaw's division, who are Hardy's best troops, extending the line over in this direction. Except for you don't see them on the map. Problem is, the wheels start coming off the Confederate plan pretty early on. McClaws, some crazy reason, and that crazy reason is called Braxton Bragg, winds up down here, well to the bottom, well south of the road. Uh, Braxton Bragg sees, sees Carlin's men along the road. He thinks he's being assaulted. He wants reinforcements. He wants help from Johnston. Johnston, who's trying to set that positive example I talk, talked about earlier, says, Okay, well, I've got one division coming on the field. It's McClaw's division. But the problem is that's about a fifth of Johnson's infantry, 20% of Johnson's infantry, gets sent down there to Bragg. And that would have been okay if Bragg could really use them. But once McClaw's gets down there, he finds it's an impassable swamp. He can't barely deploy. He can't deploy, and he can't advance. So he can't be attacked. So what's he doing there? More or less, they get marching practice to get down there. Um, um, you know, McClaws is basically going to make it back around by evening. Remember, one thing I even struggle with, I've been at Bentonville for um, a long time, uh, March, where our anniversary is, uh, probably, what, 10, 12 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, they extended daylight savings time. Um, so, um, so it's still pretty light at 7 o'clock in March, um, in the middle of March. Well, it was not daylight like savings time in 1865. So remember that the major Confederate assault still hadn't happened. It's, up to, it's finally going to eventually happen at 245. So that really doesn't give them a lot of time to accomplish all their goals of knocking out a 35-man army. Uh, and it doesn't go real well when McClaws down there out of the way. Um, So, um, eventually, to fill that gap, I told you those three regiments weren't there yet earlier, uh, to fill that gap that Carlin has created in his own line, um, a 20th Corps Brigade, James Robinson's Brigade, these guys right there, are sent up toward, towards the coal house to fill the gap. Robinson is angry because he commands five regiments, or six regiments, really, um, but he's only allowed to take three. And he says his six aren't big enough to fill that gap. 
and he's been sent up with three. And he says, I was so damn mad over the position in which my brigade was placed that I felt like pitching into the whole fraternity of commanding generals. In fact, I told Slocum the next time three regiments of my brigade were sent to the front and three to the rear, I would go with the latter. <coughs> so what's going to happen is Rubs is going to get pushed up front just in time for that major assault. They don't even have time to dig in. Uh, that major assault once again takes place at 245. Supposed to start go from right to left. So, call first division, Army of Tennessee, a break right here in the junior reserves. They're, they're not supposed to advance at all, probably because they're 16, 17 year olds. Um, and then Hope is supposed to advance. Um, but Bragg does not want to do anything until McCloss gets in position. Um, so, Carlin is looking out across this field from that ravine he has his men dug in in. And he knows his men are nervous. He's got about 1,800 of them there. 6,500 Confederates emerged from those woods, bearing down on them in long gray lines, over, uh, almost a mile long, um, in two ranks. Uh, um, Carlin decides that um, Pass the time till some of my staff officers or escort should return. I walk along the right of Buell's line. So Buell's one of his brigade commanders, the one on the left there. Um, uh, I walk, walk along Buell's line, and they were, and I found that some rudimentary breastworks had been thrown up. They were built of logs and fence rails along the ground. I had gone to the extreme right of Buell's line and was standing by the last man in the regiment on the right. He was a very tall, strong man who looked like a brave and true soldier that acted as if he was nervous. Well, of course he's nervous. He's 6,500 Confederates marching out of space, right? I noticed, however, that the rebel line had advanced by that point very closely to ours and was halting the fire. I noticed particularly three soldiers among the trees in front of the man, and thinking I could steady his nerves, I took the gun from his hand and fired at the group of men just mentioned who were not over 20 yards from us. I then turned to my right to return the gun to its rightful bearer. He was still there and took his gun, but there was not another Union soldier of his brigade or any other command in sight. He went to the rear to his regiment. Whether he reached it or not, I cannot say. So General Carlin's division had been ordered to retreat by its brigade commanders who were tired of waiting for Carlin's permission to pull back. Uh, remember, how's Carlin adored in that fine uniform? So, Carlin's going to try to get away too, and then he's, you know, scratches the better part of Valor at this point. Um, um, but he's going to go and trip and fall, and fall in that ravine, that muddy, swampy ravine. And a, a lieutenant uh, from the 21st Michigan says, uh, says that they should use Carlin as a stepping stone to escape dry shod. And once again, Carlin's dressed in his finest uniform. So the soldiers literally step on Carlin's back as they're trying to run away. Uh, that saves Carlin's, Carlin from being, from embarrassment in a way, or maybe saves his life. life. He's covered in mud now, and he's able to literally slink away back to the Union lines because the Confederates do not recognize him. That's how bad he's, that's how bad he's shaped he's bad, that fine uniform he's in. Carlin's division collapses. Uh, the Confederates are advancing rapidly on the Army of Tennessee right here, capturing most of a Union artillery battery in the process. Robinson's forced to retreat in that as well. Um, and uh, that, that's a description from the North Carolina Junior Reserves who, 16 years old, watched this Confederate charge from across the way. It's the coolest thing these boys have ever seen. Uh, it's kind of their heroes are doing this charge, these guys they've been hearing about of their, the past three years, uh, past three and a half, four years as, as the war's gone on. Um, but you know, like a painting from the picture is great, but how close those battle flags were together, showing how small these units are. Remember, 4,500 of a 70,000 man army. But most of those regiments still exist. So these regiments are a dozen, 20, you know, strong regiments are just, just over 100 men. Uh, Carlin is not out of the fight. By the General Carlin. His army doesn't, his division never really regains confidence enough to re engage during the battle. But while all that's happening going on, our friend Braxton Bragg, below the road, he 
here did not advance with host division. This ground was open, except for being swampy, and it still is swampy. I was in it yesterday. Um, woods and swampy. Um, union trenches, I was surveying union trenches that are still there. <coughs> We're in the process of trying to get a walking trail in, in there. Um, Bragg should have advanced and captured that ground, which would have kept a contiguous Confederate line, right? Um, but Bragg was waiting for McCloss. And then when McCloss finally gets there, because Bragg can't just have him anywhere along the line, he wants him way down here. When McCloss finally gets there, he can't use him anyway, so Bragg then attacks. But in the meantime, this guy, General James Morgan, who's the anti carlin he commands the 2nd Division, um, he's dug in. They can't dig very deep trenches because it's muddy, swampy. Every time they would dig trenches, um, the, gra the trenches would fill up with water. But they were able to fall trees and stuff like that, build defenses. And so when Hoke under Bragg attacks, instead of occupying open ground, they're going to be running into Morgan's trenches. Now, um, Morgan, slow, steady. How's he? But he's not West Point trained. Never. He was a Mexican War volunteer. Um, but he becomes, he's a brigadier general by 1865. Well, he can't start it out as a company captain because he equipped his own company with so wealthy. And so um, he did what he's told. Not imaginative. He's going to do what he's told, and he's going to eventually rise through the ranks. Um, and he's going to hold that ground um, against repeated Confederate assaults um, because Braxton Bragg allows him to do so. And so once Bragg attacks, they're hitting trenches. Um, the Confederate assaults from north of the road, though, they had gone really well. Well, those guys are going to eventually wind up south of the road behind Morgan right here. And Bragg's, Bragg's um, attack has been repulsed by that point. Morgan's able to turn his men around and fight backwards, <clears throat> fight the trenches backwards. And then the Union soldiers start calling this area the bullpen because they're surrounded on all sides. Um, so the wheels start falling off from the Confederates here. Eventually, the Confederates make it all the way to Slocum's headquarters on the Ray Morris farm, but 21 Union artillery pieces are flying up and shatters um, the rest of the Confederate attacks, um, which culminate about 6 o'clock that evening. Um, so Johnson is doing his best, fired his best shot. He's only able to knock out one Union division out of the six. Um, and um, Slocum's arm. And here's that artillery concentration there on the Morris farm, as illustrated by um, William Wad. Um, so we work. Um, illustrator for uh, Harper's Weekly and others, Frank Edwards. Um, so Johnson says back, yep, yeah, we attacked Sherman. We did really good. The men paid much braver than I thought, than, than their, their officers told me they were going to. Everything went, went really well. Uh, we knocked out, you know, part of one division. They fell back on reinforcements. Uh, we're standing toe to toe with them. Um, Lee sends back, I cannot ex but express my congratulations on your victory on the 19th. The skills we plan and boldly executed, the gratification it will give to the country will be equivalent to the gratification which will be felt for yourself and the brave army that achieved it. <laughs> Johnson instantly realizes that maybe he exaggerated a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, your reply to my telegram to Action 19th in Bentonville makes me apprehend that my brief account may have given an exaggerated idea of our success. Uh, I therefore write a more minute one. Um, but the Battle of Bentonville is three days. It's not just that, that one day. I would argue that it's decided on that one day, but it's three days. Johnston does hang around. Anti the John, uh, complete opposite of Johnston's reputation, Johnston's uh, inclinations. He's going to hang around. Uh, rem remember those orders that he gets from Lee. Keep Sherman occupied. Keep Sherman busy. Protect my food stuff. So he's got Sherman in front of him. And Johnston's going to be able to call on a couple thousand reinforcements starting to arrive. That's, you know, nothing compared to what Sherman's going to get. But if Johnston makes a reinforced line <coughs> around Mill Creek Bridge, which is his only route on and off the field now, with the Union Army coming from the east now, from the west is the army they fought on the first day, 
and they're going to be, those armies are going to link to the south of the Confederate line. The Confederates have that one route off. Um, if they can form strong defensive works, maybe Sherman will attack him, a la Kennesaw Mountain. Who's been to Bentonville before? Did y'all see any mountains in Bentonville? Uh, no. no. Uh, it's pretty flat. So um, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. Uh, that's eventually what's going to happen. They're skirmishing on me on the second day, and I, what's a skirmish, what's a major battle? If you're shooting at me, I think it's a major battle, don't get me wrong. But skirmishing there, it's not, there's no headlong assaults. This guy, uh, who really, to me, favors Mark Wahlberg, um, uh, it's generally Vander Law. Uh, he's been in charge of a, of a Confederate counter division, actually Butler's division. Um, Butler's sick. He's been sent to slow down their entire right wing, arriving 30,000 more Union soldiers with about 1,500 cavalry. Um, he does that by, by putting barricades on the road, but eventually he's going to be overwhelmed. He falls back on help from Joe, Joe Wheeler. And they fight for the crossroads here just in time to give Johnson that chance to redeploy. But by the evening and morning of the 20th and morning of the 21st, the entire right wing is on the field and it's raining. The last gasp of action really by the left wing on the morning of the 20th is by, um, by this guy. Um, uh, he's going to lead a, um, um, George, George Roman, he's commander of the, the um, 14th Michigan. He's going to take his regiment and 16th of Illinois in pursuit of Johnson's retreat, of what he thinks of Johnson's retreat. For Johnson's redeployment, he's going to take his men out into the open, and they're going to get massacred. He's going to allow, he's going to be able to retreat with the 14th Michigan, but the word never makes it to the 16th of Illinois, and those guys take very severe casualties. Um, Grogan's going to go on the following year, 1866. Um, he's going to, him and all, all of his men are going to be killed fighting Indians in what was called the Veteran Fight, or the Veteran Massacre. Uh, we would all of that, that would probably still be a household name if 10 years later, um, the, um, uh, Custer's last stand had happened 10 years later. So uh, we would all recall the veteran fight, um, which was happening in Wyoming. What is now Wyoming? Um, yep, there's a artist recreation. Um, was not a, uh, uh, eyewitness because they were awful. Um, so, on the Union side, O.O. Howard had to backtrack to Bentonville. He wants to come over there and crush Johnson's force, and Sherman's not allowing that to happen. Sherman's worried what kind of trick Johnson has up, up his sleeve. And, you know, maybe if Johnson wants me to attack, then I need to be careful because you know, he's got some sort of thing there. Uh, he's got some sort of su surprise he's going to spring on me. So Sherman's going to hold back. He also doesn't have a lot of supplies. Remember, he's been on the march since leaving Georgia. Doesn't have a whole lot of supplies. Um, so he's going to start sending from help from the coast. Um, but he's going to hang out and bet that no, he's not going to leave Johnson there because if Johnson is left holding the field, he can claim victory. Um, so Sherman's going to hang out, but he's going to restrain his army from launching a, a massive assault, which is what Howard wanted to do. Um, Howard... Um, Howard's kind of left out of this, this decision-making process when one of Howard's division commanders in the 17th Corps, Frank Blair's Corps, um, gets permission from Blair and Sherman to do a little reconnaissance. And what's a little reconnaissance in Joseph Mower's mind, Major General Joseph Mower's mind, it is a, a, a long circuitous loop uh, with his 5,000 men winding up at General Johnson's headquarters on the Confederate far left. Mower really wanted to trigger a battle. And so he more or less disobeyed orders. Uh, he's going to he's going to really disobey Sherman's orders. He's going to really trigger a battle, which is going to make Howard even more angry because Sherman does not allow the remaining the army to go try to extract Mower's division. Um, in that um, that assault there on the Confederate headquarters, Johnson ran out on foot in the middle of the afternoon. Allegedly, he's in his slippers. I can't tell you why. Uh, maybe plantar fasciitis for all I know, but, um, <laughs> but Johnson's going to run out on foot. A lot of Confederate cavalry takes off and runs away, but eventually General Hardy, commanding the big Confederate right, is going to be ordered by Johnson to come across and stabilize the situation. Hardy's going to use Hampton's cavalry as a uh, more or less human wave 
on horseback assaults. You don't really see a lot of cavalry charges against infantry during the Civil War, but it was one of those exceptions. Um, uh, Eight Texas Cavalry right in the fray. Uh, the problem for General Hardy is, as the 8th Texas Cavalry is really successful and they were riding off the field, and it slowed down mower and mower finally retreats from Hardy's infantry, Hardy celebrated with Wade Hampton, said, boy, that was nip and tuck, and for a second I thought tuck had it. And he turns, though, and sees 16-year-old Willie Hardy you know, slumped in the saddle um, over, the, over one of the horses in the 8th Texas Cavalry. So how does Willie Hardy wind up in, in, in Terry's Texas Rangers? He's not from Texas. Um, he's a general's son, though, and he had been begging for a combat post, and very there at the end, Hardy finally lets down, lets him go to Calvary. Typically, Calvary's job is not nearly as bloody as infantry, so he thinks he may be safe, um, but Hard, young Willie Hardy's mortally wounded, he's going to die here in nearby Hillsboro three days later at General Kirkland's house. Um, but, Mower is repulsed, and Johnson realizes it's time to go. Once he can. Once he can. Alright. We're hung up here. Anyways. Um, Justin does realize it's time to go, and eventually he's going to um, retreat um, across No Creek Bridge that night, sending his Wounded first, artillery next, and then his infantry. Sherman's going to allow a couple of regiments to pursue Johnson to the next creek up, but after that bridge is burned, Sherman's more than happy to get on the Goldsboro, which is where he's been trying to get to since leaving Georgia. And um, he's going to allow Johnson's army to go up to Smithfield. Johnson's 50 more reinforcements. His army's going to go swell to somewhere in the order of 30,000 men. Starts being the way, what you might consider a respectable. Um, if not, if not moderate size army. Um, but, but to Johnson's dismay, Sherman's going to get 30,000 more re reinforcements himself. And his army's going to swell to over 90,000. Sherman's goal, Sherman's job at this point now is no longer to link up with Grant. As you guys know, the siege of Petersburg, Lee's going to finally escape and get pinned up on April 9th. Mattox. And Lee makes a point only voted to surrender those armies under his control. Uh, we wouldn't be here, you know, today. Um, but um, April 9th, coincidentally, and it is coincidentally, uh, that's the day Sherman's army advances out of Goldsboro, heading towards Johnston. And Johnston retreats ahead of them, trying to stay ahead of them far enough. Retreating on through Raleigh, keep on retreating, makes it as far as Greensboro. And, um, and that's when those negotiations start, and I don't need to tell you guys, those, those experts here, how that goes, but, um, uh, so Benton will, once again, 4,133 casualties, um, I don't know if I can say, um, what kind of, um, outcome that, that, uh, left on the war, I think if the Confederates had been much more successful, um, then, um, then yes, Maybe it would have slowed things down, but it was a tall task to expect Johnston to defeat what ultimately becomes three Union armies here in North Carolina. It's just, it's just uh, beyond. So at that point, it, it becomes let's get favorable terms. And those terms were, of course, too favorable, of course, at first. Um, so let's see if I can get this slideshow back on the rails. I do want to show you guys quickly before I wrap up. My nip and tuck, and there this is an artist's recreation of um, Moore's Charge. And that's the village of Bentonville in the aftermath, burning a Union army, burns a turpentine distillery. They're angry because they find some mutilated corpses, which are most likely Union foragers that Confederate cavalry had ambushed. Um, they're angry, they burn a turpentine distillery, which happens to have a carriage shop next to it. You can imagine how that goes for the whole village. And Bentonville never recovered from this. It's more of a place now. I've been to this place before here. <laughs> so, I don't know why Joe Johnson looks like Lee in that image. I've always wondered that. But, um, so, once again, um, if, Johnson, if Johnson had pulled off some sort of miracle, yes, it may have slowed the, the eventual Confederate shooters down, but it did not. It would not have in the war. I mean, it would not have been in the war or anything if 
I've got better sign. Oh, we're gonna snooze there. Um, so Sherman, who would not have done well on the 19th, he misses the big action. He minimizes it in his memoirs, um, but one federal source of the 19th severity in which this regiment was engaged. Um, 16th of Illinois, once again, Herman Long, Long, the colonel of the 16th of Illinois, said that, that he was there last battle and the worst of, of all of them. And another Confederate soldier said that the place of Gettysburg has haunted them until I could not find it. I never confirmed if he was actually at Gettysburg, but, but yes, but taking his word for it. Um, so, Bentonville today, at the Harper House, you can come on the visit, which served as a Union hospital during the battle. He mentioned Mr. Harper. Um, Despite it being a Union hospital, 54 Confederates were treated there by Union surgeons, and, and 23 of them died in the Harper's care afterwards, and they were buried on the property next to the Center. Uh, Does a Harper house up for sale? No, sir. Uh, there's a house in Aversboro that asked for sale, okay. private house. No, uh, last night, I hope the Harper house is up for sale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 My, uh, my job, uh, yeah, my job, yeah, uh, I hope it's not for sale. <laughs> so Gold for Rifle Monument groups came to bury the Confederate dead. 30 years later, Union dead were moved to Raleigh in 1867, so they had to worry about burying them. 30 years later, they come to find the Confederate dead. This monument says 360 Confederate soldiers are buried here. Uh, probably actually means the battlefield itself. And once again, there's those military Wow. Yeah, last year, uh, last March. Uh, and it was one for every casualty. One four thousand one hundred and thirty-three. That now number will always be ingrained in my mind, if not on my thumb. Those uh, clickers. But yeah, it was very moving. Um, those lights at the end. We did a lantern. We had several casualties that we were that we had images of that we we, we put, put them on board. So uh, something really cool on that. We hope to do. Any questions? Not everybody at once. Now. Yes, sir. Uh, I went there several years ago and mm -hmm. chatted with Larry Lamoda, I think mm -hmm. his name. And how do you associate with him? He has the only private property. He has some two really cool looking monuments there in his front yard or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we do associate with Larry. Uh, his uh, wife is a volunteer of ours. Um, um, in fact, she was a part time private. Um, Larry has sold a lot of property to us, but he does own, own right where they, um, the uh, house that he moved there and, the, and, a, and a couple old store buildings that his dad moved there. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we have a good relationship. Um, he's not the only property owner. Um, Bentonville, the battle, covers 6,000 acres. Um, we have about 2,300 of it right now. We would like to get a lot more. Here, can you lose Yeah. Well, what were those figures again? 6,500, y'all own 23? So 6,000, we own 2,300. But we also remember we have a staff of five, so, and one maintenance position. So, um, so we would like to expand if we can get a way of managing it. But so a lot of property owners. And we have a good relationship with local farmers who were the stewards of the battlefield for years and years and years. In fact, a family just donated probably Let's say conservative estimate about 80 pounds of silver artifacts to us, including about 50 pounds of musket and puzzle meatballs. Um, um, so, and our property that is farmland, we lease that out to local farmers who also help us keep an eye on the battlefield. It, it's really kind of a staff work in many ways. Um, so, a very positive relationship. Um, you know, Larry, Larry um, is a retiree, but, but a lot of folks are local, local farmers. Much about the retreat towards Greensboro. Um, um, my no. understanding of Plainsville is where a lot of the Confederate soldiers were during the uh, surrender terms. Um, yeah, I mean that that makes sense. Um, um, I know I know a lot of the smaller places around you know around Guilford, uh, around Guilford County and and probably as far far um, maybe as far east as uh, Orange County um, and, and 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 points south down to where Salisbury is, where they were kind of spread out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, two big chunks um, around Greensboro, and then another one around uh, High Point as well. Hardy's Court ends up primarily in Hart, uh, High Point and Trinity, 
and those smaller areas. So yeah. Once once word starts trickling in that Lee surrendered, uh, keeping discipline and keeping the army together become become a next to impossible uh, because these guys who've been been paroled at Appomattox are trickling through. Uh, why why are you boys still fighting? Remember when you get back to Lee politically. Um, popular, um, popularly, I guess, and politically, um, his his importance and with what's what's he's given up. Um, a lot of these guys who are not under in Lee's exact in, in Lee's chain chain of command anymore, they're still going to start going out. Uh, yeah. Yes. Now, did I heard that Dobson wanted to keep the army together in order to get the Absolutely. Well, yeah, so, um, right, if you have an army, you can get much better terms, right? I mean, you know, if you have an army that you at least technically have the threat of continuing to keep on fighting, um, you can demand much better terms than if you're just trickling in as a few individuals. Um, so I guess the threat of Johnson's up Johnson to be able to have his army do some sort of guerrilla fighting in the mountains or retreating, retreating wherever. Forces having to keep following them, um, that that ultimately um, maybe probably instigated Sherman to have some of his more limited views um, that first go around. It wasn't necessarily that. I went and, and, I, and I say lenient just to especially groups that are not really familiar with it. Not necessarily lenient, lenient but more so beyond the beyond the pale. surrender papers that the soldiers would sign in Greensboro, did that allow them to possibly get train rides mm -hmm. home, stuff like that? If I there's a train, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, there's <laughs> not, if, if there's tracks, yes. Yeah. And if there's a riverboat, you know, public public tra transportation on the government side. I've often wondered that, though, about the parolees at the Harper House. And we have no, no my assumption would be they did not. Uh, my parolees at the Harper House who were paroled in March Sherman leaves. That's the reason those wounded Confederates were left there, and they don't have room for them in the wagons to haul them off as prisoners, so they paroled them. And many of them are handkerchiefs, so they're fighting as they're over there. They're not threats anymore. But you're from Texas, and you don't have that, you don't have that parole that eventually Lee's, Lee's men are going to have, or Council's men are going to have. Um, that, that spot here. You know, but by the time you, you, you start heading home, maybe, maybe there are paroles to be Thank you guys. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you.